building a tagless final DSL for WebGL. My name is Luca Jakobowitz. Um, I'm from Germany, Düsseldorf, Germany. Um, I like to do a lot of Scala, especially in my free time. I do a lot of uh, type level projects. So that's kind of cool. Check that out. Um, OK, so without further ado, I'm going to start. And I'm going to start with the motivation for this talk, right? So tagless final is an encoding. But why would we actually need it, or what is it good for? So basically, what, it, what we often have as functional programmers, right? We, we don't want side effects, so, but we still often have to like interface uh, or work with some like super imperative languages. Um, and for this talk, I chose to use a library called WebGL, which probably most of you know, but it's like this super, super imperative language, right? So it's kind of hard to find anything more imperative than graphics programming. <laughs> OK, so um, how can we then give these libraries a nice and clean functional API? Right, that's, this is like the, the main question of this talk. And um, the answer, of course, is actually, oh, the answer is not, not this, <laughs> but this is a, a, an answer. <laughs> that was too fast there. OK, so the solution number one is to just wrap anything in I.O. or task or whatever, just these side effect uh, capturing monads. And um, this works. This is completely purely functional, right? But the problem with this is, to me, that it's, it might be purely functional, but it's also not really better than working with imperative programming because there's a lot of like like uh, hidden things going on here that we can't observe so in order to get like a, a really functional API a declarative a API there's still a lot lots of work to be done and um, some other problems is are that uh, this breaks like the separations of concerns. Right here we see like we are printing, but we're also like creating DOM elements. We're using the GL library. Um, it's like it's not nice, right? We we don't have any way to disambig disambiguate between like an I/O that does um, does like DOM things or an I/O that does WebGL things or logging things. So there's a lot of things. Um, that we don't like about this, that I don't like about this. It's also super difficult to test because the only way to test it is to actually run it and then you have to like manually check the DOM and then you have all the problems with like mutability and it's, it's kind of a mess. And also it's hard to keep track uh, of the level of ab abstraction because like right here, like this gl.clearcolor, it's a super, super low level call but um, we also have this more higher level DOM, um, DOM API that we're working with. So it kind of mixes and matches whatever and it just wraps it all in this one type called IO. Um, it's not what we want. So it'd be really cool if we could just use like a functional DSL to access all of our imperative libraries that sadly still exist. <laughs> and a short digression, if you've read my abstract, I talk a lot about eDSLs in it and um, what's actually the E in eDSL. So if we talk about like normal DSL, we have something like GLSL, which is the GL shading language. We have SQL, we have shell scripts. These are all languages in their own right, right? And embedded DSLs, which is what the E stands for, <laughs> are um, embedded into another language. This means we build up like a tree of expression or it doesn't actually have to be a tree. We build up something and then we compile it into like Scala or Haskell or any language that acts basically as the host of our DSL. So it's actually part uh, of the language. It's, it's expressed inside of the language. That's, those are embedded DSLs. So what kind of eDSLs could we have? Um, like the most simple thing you can think of is to just use an AST, right? And we can express these as uh, generalized or not generalized uh, algebraic data types. Um, if you think about like a really small example, you can build like a arithmetic expression as, as like an algebraic data type. And then you can compile it to different things. You could, you could use like an interpreter to, uh, to pretty print it. You can use it in, could use an interpreter to actually um, do the arithmetic and get out like a number, numeric value. So this is also uh, this is 
already kind of cool, like ASTs are pretty cool, but we don't really get a lot of, um, we don't really get a lot of flexibility in the sense that like we want a lot, we want our, uh, our computations to be in a, to behave in a certain way. And that's where something like the free monad or free applicatives come in. Because free monad, if you've watched uh, Rob's talk yesterday, he, he talked about uh, monads. And monads basically allow you to uh, express dependent sequential computations. Right? So this is super, super powerful. And it's, it's no, no wonder that uh, a lot of talks around here are about monads. And basically, the free monad, uh, what it does is it allows you to borrow like this monad structure. And, um, and we can build our algebras in terms of these monad structures and um, basically just sequence the actions of our algebra. And um, the applicative, on the other hand, can do what an applicative does, um, which is independent computation. So we can do all of our independent computations um, defined as an algebra. So these are the two uh, I'm not going to talk about today. What I'm going to talk about, of course, is tagless final. And tagless final basically, is, uh, basically works like this. So we model our algebras not as, trait, uh, not as actual data structures, but instead as an abstract trait, right? And we parameter that, parameter, that is such a dumb word, <laughs> parameterize with the, our, our, <laughs> our algebra with the type constructor. And this type constructor will, um, when interpreted, it will represent our effect type, right? Effect type in the sense like uh, option or list or IO is an effect, right? Okay, so um, then we can build programs with these algebras and actually constrain them. This means um, we get to choose actually the, uh, the behavior to constrain them with. Like with, with a free monad, we're bound to a monad. Um, and lots of times in tagless final, we will want to use the monad because, um, well, dependent, calcu uh, dependent computations are so powerful and so useful that it's just like the, mo the thing that makes most sense. But a lot of times, we don't actually need the power of monads. So we can use whatever we want. A lot of times, just uh, the flat map Type class is enough. A lot of times, also, we might just want to use independent computations. So an applicative is enough, or even just an apply. So really, the, the principle of least power completely applies when doing uh, tagless final algebras, tagless final programs, sorry. Um, and then, when we want to actually interpret our algebras, we can just simply uh, define an implementation for our algebra, right? So if our algebra is an abstract trait, uh, the interpreter is just an implementation. So it's, it's super simple. We don't have to deal with like these fancy uh, natural transformations or any of that. So let's look at a very simple example. So right here at the top, we have our uh, algebra, which is just going to be um, an algebra that describes console-like programs. So dealing with uh, like printing and reading. It's a really simple example, and it's kind of overused for these kind of things, but uh, it works. <laughs> so we have two actions, two operations. The first one is print line, which takes a string and then returns our, uh, our type parameter uh, with, with a unit inside, right? So this f is co totally abstract right now, and it doesn't represent anything. Um, and then we also have read line, which returns a string inside something. And then, once we build our program, we actually say, okay, our f has to be a monad. So what this means, basically, is that we, we're, we want to run these um, operations in the algebra sequentially, right? Uh, they're dependent on each other. So our program right here um, just takes as a parameter our console al algebra uh, constrained by f. And then it will just print out, please enter your name. And then it will get the name from, from, from your console when you type something into it. And then it will just print out again, you entered your name. And that's the whole program. Bless you. <laughs> and um, then to define an interpreter, it's really simple. We can 
we can use, well, we just have to implement this trait, right? So we can use an object, but we could also use like a, uh, uh, an anonymous class, uh, no, 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 yeah, an anonymous class. Um, lots of different ways, we could just use a val. But uh, the most simple way I find is to just use an object um, that extends the, the, the trait. And what we can see here is we, um, we basically interpret it into a Monix task, because Monix task is kind of cool. Uh, but it doesn't really have to be a Monix task. Right? It doesn't have to be uh, an IO type at all. It could be like uh, to test it, we could just interpret it into ID, which is then just the type itself. Um, or we could use any other things to like test or play with the algebra. Um, yeah, so the implementation is super simple. We just print and uh, read and all of that inside the task. And then at the end to run, to actually run our program or to interpret the program, we just say the program and then we inter insert the interpreter inside and then this part is basically the, a task of unit and then we just run it. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool, pretty basic, but let's look at uh, something like combining algebras, because this is kind of difficult and free. <laughs> so here, right here we have a second uh, algebra that's going to be a key value store, and uh, it has two functions defined on it, and the first one is just put, where we give it a string and an A, and it's going to return nothing. And the second one is get, where we just get a, uh, we put in a string and we want to get something out of it. But we can't guarantee that it's in there, so we get an option of A. And then to, uh, to create a program with it, it's actually super simple. It, not much has changed, except for the fact that we're just going to enter two, uh, two algebras, right? So this is the only new part here, and the rest, and the rest basically uh, stayed the same. Well, of course, we, changed, we also changed our program to, at the end, put the uh, name inside of our key value store. And also, I changed the, um, the constraint on the f-type parameter to be a flat map instead, because we don't actually, we're not actually using the pure function inside here anywhere. So um, oftentimes, we can use the principle of least power and just use whatever type class we actually need. So, so far this is pretty cool. We can do a lot of things, but now comes like the, the real cool part that allows us to, um, to do a lot of, to, do, to write really cool DSLs. And this is uh, layering your languages, right? So, if we want to do um, some really fancy stuff with GL, WebGL, we're gonna want to define like a low level language that exactly represents um, the operations on GL, and then we can define higher level languages and compile down to them, right? So I think like Rob Norris, he does uh, something similar with Free and Doobie. He like automatically generates all of the uh, JDBC, JDBC methods onto like uh, into free algebras, and then he defines a higher order, uh, a higher level language that compiles down to them. And this is the same idea, right? So we have our trait prompt, our new algebra prompt, and basically what it's supposed to do is just uh, write something to the console and then read it back, uh, and then read whatever came back, right? So it, you put a string in, you, put a str you get a string out, right? And um, to, to build an interpreter that interprets to the console algebra we defined before, we just pass it into the interpreter, right? So, um, Basically, this is all you need to, uh, to interpret your higher level language into the lower level language, right? So this is super easy as well. And now let's check out some, some actual code that I wrote for WebGL. Okay, so first, the idea is to, um, to make a small game, like a racing game, this is, um, a small racetrack that I built out of individual tiles that my friend Simon created for a university project years ago. Um, and what I wanted to do is to, to build a game that's basically like Mario Kart, a Super Mario Kart or F-Zero and the SNES. 
I'm not sure if any of you remember, probably in this audience, but uh, basically what the SNES could do was not do actually 3D, but it could basically do uh, perspective projection so, so that you could have like a single tile as, um, as, as like the, the background of, uh, of a scene um, and you could totally, like it looked super 3D uh, back in the day, but it was actually just, all, it was all tiles, right? So uh, here is my car. So it, you can just see it like from behind. It's not a model or anything, it's just a tile. It's just a sprite. Okay, so first I defined um, an algebra to work with the DOM. And this is, this is not obviously the whole algebra to work with the DOM, this is just what I needed. What we can see right here, that we have the basic building blocks. Uh, is this big enough? Can everyone see this right? Okay, great. So we have an append to body function. We want to create image elements, of course. Uh, we want to render something in a loop. Um, we want to catch key, key events, like on key down, on key up. It's super simple, but um, it's necessary. And then we also have a WebGL algebra that is the lowest, the lower level algebra. And what's, ha what's happening here is just basically wrapping or wrapping the exact API that WebGL gives us. We can see here that it's pretty, like there's lots of things going on. To create a, like a shader, we need to do, we need to call the create shader function, then we need to call the shader source function, we need to compile the shader, then we don't know if something went wrong, so we get the, like, have to get shader parameters and then the info log. So it's a kind of like a, a mess, right, and we need to create programs out of these shaders. Um, we need to create like at least a vertex and fragment shader. And um, we also need to link that program. We can then get program parameters and use the program. So there's a lot, lots and lots of stuff going on to create textures just as much and to, uh, to, to actually draw something. We need to like bind all of these things. But the whole thing is super imperative, right? Most of the things we return here are fUnit. So what I did was to define a simple algebra that does this a lot more succinctly, right? So we can, what we can do with this algebra, which is called draw image, which is not a great name, but we'll deal with that later. We can create a full-size canvas with this. We can clear the screen in a red, green, and blue values, RG, uh, ARGB. Uh, we can compile a vertex shader, and instead of getting all these small steps, we, we just, com we just uh, give it a source, and then we get back an F of either an error or the vertex shader, and same with the fragment shader. And then to create a program, we actually have to give it a vertex shader and a fragment shader, and even that can fail, so we also get like an either back here. And then we can create a texture info with an HTML image element, and uh, in the end we want to draw an image by just giving it the valid program, giving it a WebGL texture, which we get from here, and then a matrix to determine the position. And matrix four is just a four by four matrix used for all of this uh, graphic stuff. So let's check out a program written in this, um, in this algebra. So basically, what happens here is what I call simple race, even though it doesn't actually run in a loop yet, so there's no racing going on, <laughs> but never mind. And I constrained the whole program by a monad, and I needed the, the DOM algebra and the draw image algebra. And I define here like some vertex shader code, some fragment shader code, which I'm not gonna get into much. Um, I got the track here, the, the track scale here, which is the matrix for uh, scaling the track. It's kind of big, 20 by 20. I translate it to some place, and I also define the model uh, matrix for the cars and the view matrix. So, but this is the interesting part, right? We can now use these uh, operations we defined inside of our tagless algebra to, um, well, to basically build the program, right? So we create a full-size canvas uh, with the WebGL, uh, with the draw image algebra, and then we append it to the body. We create a projection view ma matrix. We compile the fragment shader, the vertex shader. So this is actually, this should be an either of, uh, either of string or, there it says, either a string or the vertex shader. And then the programs should also be 
like either an, um, might be IntelliJ can do that, but it should be either a string or the, the compiling program. And we also create image elements, uh, and then we create textures out of these. Uh, we clear the screen and then we traverse our either um, and then just draw these two images. So it's, it's not a lot, but this, this actually works. I'm not gonna run this right now because I don't have that much time. Instead, um, because this is kind of medium level, I, I built another even higher level uh, uh, algebra for it. So I call this one render engine, even though it's totally not an engine. But I just, uh, I just wanted to show you what you can do by just parameterizing even further, right? So this render engine, it takes, um, it, it has two, two functions. The first one initializes the engine and then we just run a render loop. So this is, it's, it's not a lot of stuff going on here, but um, we have this, we given this options, which is parameterized <laughs> by the engine. So um, we actually get to choose what kind of options we do this when we have an interpreter for it. And then we also parameterize the error type. So if the initialization fails, it's gonna return either the error type E or a context, which we also don't know what it is because it's also parameterized. And then um, we, get, uh, we get the second function, which is render loop, where we give it the context that we created when our initialization uh, worked. And then we give it a seed, which is um, a render output. So it's, this is, render output is just like the initial object. So we have a camera, which is just like the position of the camera and the position where the camera looks at. And uh, then a list of render objects, which are also parameterized by this texture object. So it would, doesn't necessarily have to be like a WebGL texture. It could be anything else. And yeah. So this is, oh yeah, we also have this function that, um, that determines what the camera is gonna do next. So basically this um, function takes um, the old camera and a set of keys. So anytime you press something on your screen, um, this, this, the keys are gonna be in, inside the set. And we, we, uh, then we have to create a new camera out of these, um, out of these parameters. So this is basically like a, a scan on an observable, but yeah, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. So when we actually um, want to interpret this, we interpret this using our draw image and DOM algebras, right? So we, uh, we, we have, what we have is basically interpreters all the way down, right? So we have this super high level algebra, which compiles to our medium level algebra, and that compiles to a low level algebra. And we could build infinite amounts, well, probably not infinite, but you know, like a very, very high number of algebras that all compile to each other. And it, because this is just function application, it's basically for free. Um, so yeah, this is our render engine interpreter draw image. Sorry for the bad names, but <laughs> this is what I got. <laughs> and yeah, the, I'm not gonna go too much into what it does. This is the initialization code. It just uses all of, the, all of the stuff that we defined before. So it's very similar and then I still got a to-do here that I wanted to remove. But yeah, this is what it does. So let's actually check that out in real time. Um, yeah. So this is the final product. I'm super excited. I'm, uh, I'm just gonna do a lap. So we can go right here. We can, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, this is cool uh, because I think it showcases that like we can build complex programs. This is not really a complex program, but it's close to like a complex program. And it allows you, in, it was built using a, a pretty simple DSL. Like the algebra you saw at the end, it was, it was pretty simple, right? I mean, anyone could grasp that if you're like into programming, of course. But yeah, okay, so much for that. Let's go back to the presentation. So as a bonus slide, uh, we can also do parallelism. And um, this is the new CATS parallel class, which basically uh, lets, lets us do um, applicative uh, combination, but um, independent from the actual monad, right? So for example, task, 
has a monad instance um, where when you when you want to use the applicative um, the applicative um, function the app function to to combine two tasks um, independent from each other what it does is right now it it uses uh, it uses sequential computation but with this parallel class we can define a um, um, an applicative that does this in parallel. And uh, we can associate it with this using this parallel class. And then what we can do is use these parmap functions, or parmap end function, or stuff like par traverse, similar things, to totally do this in parallel. So uh, with free, you kind of have the problem like you either have free monads, which does everything sequentially, or you have free applicatives, which does everything, or which can do everything. Uh, in parallel, yeah, question? Right here. It's right here. Oh yeah, that's not, uh, out of scope. It's, yeah, it's kind of, uh, same as A, it's just an example, sorry. I should have picked a better example, but yeah. Um, sure, so, but this is just to showcase like this parmap and, and function and how well it works with uh, tagless final. And we can totally combine like sequential computations with parallel computations, and it all works in tagless final. There's no redirection. I know that like my colleague Marcus Hauk, he had a whole talk on how to combine free monad and free applicative, and I think most people just ran away because it was super complex. Uh, basically, had to embed the free applicative inside the free monad, and this gives it to you basically for free. Uh, that's a bad pun, but yeah. <laughs> So other cool things we can do with Tagless Final. Um, and while difficult, it's totally possible to inspect and optimize our programs. Right? So with free or with free applicative in, in particular, uh, it allows you to analyze and uh, optimize the, the program we actually built up. With Tagless Final, it's kind of difficult because you don't actually build up like a value that we can actually look inside. But uh, if you look at Oleg Kiselyov's original um, paper titled Typed Tagless Final uh, Interpreters, he actually does that for like a simple algebra. I'm, I'm pretty sure you could probably do that for more complex ones as well. So, and what I also would like to tell you about is the main Kuhn library, uh, which is built by another CATS contributor, um, Kylo Wang. And I hope I got the name right. Oof. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, 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 which allows us to like very generic, gen, generically uh, compose and transform our tagless final algebra. So it's really cool if you want to check out tagless final and uh, want to do some craziest things with it, you should totally check out Mancoon. And um, while tagless, while for example, the free monad totally uh, guarantees stack safety in, in, in all events. Um, in tagless final, it kind of depends on the monad or uh, whatever you interpret into, right? So if you interpret into a monad that, it's, that is not stack safe, you're not going to get any stack safety for free that you get with free. <laughs> but um, it is totally possible to compile our tagless final algebras into a uh, free monad and then compile that free monad back into whatever we wanted. And then we get stack safety for free. Um, so yeah. Take arrays, conclusions. Tagless final allows us to use our own algebras for defining interactions. So we saw that we can define um, like an, an algebra that exactly maps to the domain we want to use, or uh, that we want to work with. And um, all of these algebras can be composed or and or layered. And um, we can also define like multiple interpreters. Um, and this gives us super, super great flexibility and the ability to uh, test and refactor without like breaking existing code. Um, this is actually easier to do in Scala than in Haskell because in Haskell you have to uh, do this as like a type class and type classes can only have like one instance for each type. Um, so this is actually cooler in Scala than in Haskell. This is like the first time this ever happened. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and also, um, our programs, we can constrain them to be exactly as powerful as we want them to be, right? So if we need sequential and uh, parallel computation, we can, we can tell, we can constrain the program to do that and we can only interpret it with, uh, with a type that actually, um, 
actually guarantees us all of these properties. And if we don't need them, if we only need something like foldable or apply flat map, then we can, um, and we can do it with it just that. It's, it's really allows us a lot more, um, a lot more reasoning capabilities because we can constrain it to exactly what we want it to be. And at the end, we can work like at an extra level of abstraction. We also maintain flexibility, with, which is, to me, pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you're on Twitter, <laughs> thank you. You can find me at Luca Jakobowitz or on GitHub at uh, Luca JCB. Or, um, are there any questions? You, right there. Will your slides be available? Yes, definitely. I'll just post them on Twitter. So if you follow me right now, <laughs> but yeah, totally. Um, also, the code is on GitHub. I'm going to link to it uh, when I uh, upload the slides. Any other questions? Sure, Cody. I think Rob said that 2016 was the year of the on end. So is it dead now? Or? It's totally dead. No. <laughs> I think it does have like valid use cases. I'm pretty sure. Um, it's, it's pretty cool for a lot of things, especially because you get like the stack safety for free. Uh, I think Tagless Final, in a lot of cases, is cooler for when you have like a lot of algebras because composing algebras with free, you have to do the whole uh, data types a la carte thing with uh, inject k. You have to basically build up a huge co-product of all of different algebras. Um, so yeah, Tagless Final. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned introspection part with Tagless Final. Yeah. Do you, do you have any more details? Uh, my, like, I, I don't <coughs> completely understand it, to be honest. Like, I, I did the example um, that, that uh, Oleg mentioned in his paper on, in Scala. I put it into Scala, and it worked. But it's still kind of like, I, I, I couldn't explain it to you that would actually like uh, manage the detail, uh, give you the same detail that the paper has. So the paper is cool. Uh, Oleg's papers are usually cool, so you should check it out. Okay. I think. Oh, Rob. Sure. So, how do you, what, what do you think about the Yeah, OK. So the, the question was, um, that what about treating our algebras as type classes and then using uh, context bounds to pass them around? So this is basically like what Haskell, or what you would do in Haskell and PureScript, because it's the only thing available to you. Um, to be honest, it's, it's not a huge difference. It's just, I mean, I guess it looks different when you build your, uh, your interpreters and programs. but um, the only thing you could, the, that basically constrains you to do is to only have an interpreter into one type, right? So you can't have an interpreter into like task and then an interpreter into task again that does something slightly different, which is to me like an arbitrary, like it doesn't, it, you don't need to have that restriction, I think. So I don't, I don't really see any benefit in doing that, but sure you could. Maybe there, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I haven't like tried it out and contrasted it enough. Okay. No question, or is it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, just so I understand, so it sounds to me like the trade-off between uh, finally tagless and free is that, well, with free you get the trampolining, which gives you the stack safety. Yeah. However, with finally tag tagless, that mechanism is not there. Yeah. So, so you actually get a per, uh, improved performance with finally tagless. Yeah. Totally. So, so, yeah. so that's that's the trade-off. Sure. Yeah. And if you like, if you mostly you're gonna like interpret into something like I/O or a task or something like that. So and these are usually type, type uh, stack safe, and you don't probably need the whole trampolining most of the time. But yeah, if you do like, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's it. No more questions. If you have any other questions and you're too shy or you want to ask later, just I'm here. I'm around. I'm always glad to answer questions. Okay, thank you guys.